Today, Dr. Kareem Ibrahim is going to talk to us about stem cell transplant in patients with HIV. Dr. Ibrahim is a senior hematology and bone marrow transplant pharmacist at St. Vincent's Health Network in Sindri, Australia. So extend a welcome to him. Thank you. morning. Um, I would like to thank first uh, the organizing committee for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and present to you guys. Um, now, I've got a um, fair few uh, number of uh, slides to go through, and it's a um, specialized um, topic and very intense. And I'll try to make it as entertaining as possible. I don't think it's going to be anywhere near as, in as entertaining as uh, Jim Lewis's presentation from yesterday. <laughs> I don't actually have any conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, now, with the objectives of the, um, the presentation, first I'll uh, try to summarise the treatment uh, for HIV-associated lymphoma in the post-combination post antiretroviral therapy era. I'll try to invest um, um, some time in this because this is actually quite important to go through before we move to the transplant to understand how we can treat um, HIV patients with hematological malignancies, particularly lymphoma. And, and I'll be referring to uh, antiretroviral therapy. I'll be writing on the screen as a CART. Um, this is sort of the new term uh, from the highly active antiretroviral therapy, which is HART. This is sort of now changed to CART. Um, I'll summarize the use of autologous stem cell transplant for the management of HIV-associated lymphomas. I'll also um, examine the current literature on the use of allogeneic stem cell transplant for the management of hematological malignancies in HIV-infected patients, and then um, try to discuss and recognize some of the important pharmaceutical consideration and potential drug interactions uh, for HIV patients uh, receiving uh, stem cell transplant. And, and there's actually a lot of drug interactions and pharmaceutical considerations that we need to think of. Now, um, HIV and malignancies have sort of been linked since the early 1980s when um, um, patients with Kaposi's sarcoma sort of uh, started to present also with uh, concurrent symptoms of immune suppression, and uh, which was later found to be symptoms of AIDS. Um, and these patients also had nasty pneumonia, uh, which is an anemocystis pneumonia. So HIV and cancer have been sort of linked since the early 1980s. Now, and then there was the rise of the HIV-related lymphomas. In 1981, uh, they started to see this primary um, central nervous system, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. In, in 1985, there was actually this, um, the systemic non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was recognized as an AIDS-defining cancer. And in 1996, uh, primary fusion lymphoma and um, a year after that, plasmaplastic non-Hodgkin's lymphoma were recognized, which is um, particularly common uh, in, in HIV patients. It, it's fairly rare to see the non-HIV patients. But it's not just the AIDS-defining cancers. It's actually also another spectrum of non-AIDS-defining -AIDS cancers is actually on the rise. And it's important to recognize that in the setting of our treatment. Uh, is in the setting of treating of uh, those patients, and especially those patients are also living longer. Um, HIV-infected patients are at increased risk of developing other hematological cancers like Hodgkin's lymphoma. If you look at certain studies, the, the actual increase in the risk of Hodgkin's lymphoma is up to 14-fold. Uh, increase in the risk of leukemias and multiple myeloma. And now, these cancers are not typically classified as AIDS-defining cancers, and that's why they're referred to as non-AIDS-defining cancers. So the incidence of cancer is, is generally high in the HIV patients, and whether it's the non-AIDS-defining cancers or the, or the AIDS-defining cancers, it's certainly on the rise, and we certainly see a lot more now since uh, HIV patients are living longer. And that suggests that maybe, perhaps, there is a, a link between immune suppression and cancer. But also it's important to recognize that in the setting of non-AIDS-defining cancers, the CD4 count does not always have a linear relationship with the risk of cancer. It was always perceived if you get your, your patient's CD4 count above 200, you'll protect them from the risk of cancers, but it's actually not that clear at the moment. In fact, there's a lot of um, cancers occurring in HIV patients even with very good CD4 count. And just to demonstrate that, this is a, a, a study that we presented last year at Croy, and we looked at um, 
16 patients with HIV-associated hot chickens lymphoma in our institution. And I just wanted to sort of point out um, a particular... If you look here at the... Um, uh, this is the total number of HIV patients, 16, and if you look at the median CD4 count, the median CD4 count is actually above 200 at presentation. And you get uh, a lot of uh, patients who actually have very high CD4 count, up to 970. And 70% of the patient had undetectable viral loaded diagnosis. So these are HIV patients who have very well controlled HIV and still present with cancers. So that's important to recognize that CD4 count does not always have a linear relationship with the risk of cancer. With the treatments of HIV-associated lymphoma, now in the pre-antiretroviral therapy era, if you had HIV and lymphoma, this was pretty much a death sentence because you couldn't really tolerate any standard or intense chemotherapy. And because of that, you had very poor outcome. And obviously, very short overall survival, very high risk of opportunistic infections because patients uh, didn't get a chance to have any sort of immune recovery after the chemotherapy because the immune system was pretty low. And also, as a result, they had um, a lot of high relapse rate because they couldn't tolerate the standard or high-dose chemotherapy, which is very important to treat those um, aggressive lymphomas. But in the post-antiretroviral therapy era, the, the picture is completely changed. And, and because of antiretroviral therapy, patients are better able to tolerate um, standard and intense chemotherapy regimens. And as a result, there is a lot of improved outcomes with chemotherapy. And not only that, the actual results in the HIV patients are very similar to those seen in the non-HIV patients with lymphoma. And in order to demonstrate that, I'll just go through a couple of slides. This is a few uh, studies um, using the rituximab in chemotherapy for HIV-associated um, um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I just wanted to note that all of these studies continued um, uh, antiretroviral therapy during the chemotherapy, except perhaps for one, sorry, perhaps for one uh, that I haven't listed here. But most of the studies in the antiretroviral therapy era actually continue chemotherapy with uh, antiretrovirals. And as you can see here, there's various all types of regimens, um, ranging from RCHOP, REPOC, RCDE. But, you know, the, the rates of complete remission and the rates of overall survival is pretty impressive. I mean, this is a sort of uh, close to what we see in the, in the HIV-negative population. And what about Hodgkin's lymphoma? This paper was uh, published um, uh, by Montoto and colleagues, and they looked at 20, 224 patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma treated with ABVD. 93 patients were HIV positive, and I just wanted to point out 94% of those patients were antiretrovirals with the chemotherapy. And as you can see here, um, there is uh, not a significant difference in progression-free sur progression survival or overall survival. So results are pretty good compared to the even in the non-HIV patients. But we still have to recognize that the management of these patients are quite complex. Um, the, 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 the treatment is frequently complicated with immune suppression. Um, you, you know, patients are already immune suppressed, you're giving them more chemotherapy and hence they will have more prolonged or profound neutropenia. Also, if they had uh, opportunistic infections before, these opportunistic infections might come back and drug interactions, and, and certainly drug interactions is an area of interest to um, many people uh, treating HIV patients. And that leads us to the question, should we continue antiretroviral therapy during chemotherapy, or should we cease it? Now, and this is, becomes very important when we talk about transplanting afterwards. Now, some clinicians recommend continuation of both antiretrovirals and chemotherapy, and some don't. But Evidence and emerging evidence suggests that if you give both antiretroviral therapy with the chemotherapy, it's been shown to reduce the incidence of opportunistic infections and improves overall survival. And this is just, I've listed some um, trials that um, used antiretroviral therapy with the chemotherapy and some of the outcomes. Um, and uh, there's a few slides here and uh, they range from sort of a very small number up to this recent review, systematic review of the, this is probably the biggest systematic review of HIV patients, uh, where they looked at 19 prospective clinical trials and more than 1,500 patients, and they've noticed that the concurrent use of antiretrovirals with chemotherapy was associated with improved CR rates, 
and a trend towards improved overall survival. And certainly with the other, with the other um, studies, you can certainly see the, that the, there is definitely better outcomes with patients who continue antiretrovirals with chemotherapy. So I think the verdict is, if you can do it, it's, it's probably important to try to continue the antiretroviral therapy with the chemotherapy at the same time. But obviously we have to look for drug interactions and, and the likelihood of drug interactions is actually quite high. And these are primarily the pharmacokinetic interactions because protease inhibitors, which is a, an important class of antiretrovirals that we use in order to um, control the HIV uh, infection in our patients, it's got a lot of drug interactions. And, um, the, the very infamous is sort of uh, inhibiting the CYP3A4 and, and that can lead to um, increase the toxicity of the, the chemotherapy agents and leading to uh, delays, to treatment delays and, and increase the side effects. On the other hand, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which is sort of another class of antiretrovirals where we, we, we commonly use, they can induce the metabolism of a lot of chemotherapy drugs and hence they can reduce the efficacy and can compromise treatment. And many chemotherapy drugs are metabolized through the CYP pathway, as you know. And it's important to remember it's not just the PK drug interactions, it's also the PD drug interactions, pharmacodynamic drug interactions. Drugs like zidovudine or uh, AZT, um, it, it's got a, a tendency to cause sort of generalized cytopenias, so neutropenias and leukopenia, and that can obviously add to the myelosuppressive risk of chemotherapy. So this is not a particularly pharmacodynamic interaction, but it certainly is a pharmacodynamic interaction, and we certainly avoid uh, AZT during chemotherapy. And all you need to do here is just look at the chemotherapy. This is a sort of the, some of the common chemotherapy agents that we use in, in, um, in, in the hematology setting. And um, as you can see here, that uh, it's sort of metabolized primarily by the CYP3A4 pathway, and definitely there is an increased risk of interaction with protease inhibitors and non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. In particular, I just wanted to point out the significant interaction between vinca alkaloids and um, ritonavir, or, which is um, a pharmacokinetic booster protease inhibitor, which we use in order to boost the other protease inhibitors. And the other pr protease inhibitors too, they can definitely increase the CYP3A4 interaction and can cause significant interaction with vinca, vinca alkaloids. So that's something I would definitely want to avoid if we're giving both antiretrovirals um, and chemotherapy to our patients. So looking through the literature and, and also looking at uh, sort of, uh, we, we did, a, we did a, a study looking at 53 of our patients uh, with lymphoma and we, we presented that at ASH last year. And we certainly um, feel that, the, and we found that the protease inhibitors um, based antiretroviral therapy were significantly associated with more treatment related toxicities to other antiretrovirals that didn't have protease inhibitors. And that's, again, it's probably because of this inhibition of the, meta of the metabolism of the, chemo of the chemotherapy agents causing increase of toxicity. And we've noticed that patients on PI-based regimens or protease inhibitor-based regimens were less likely to complete the stage-appropriate chemotherapy treatment. And that's extremely important because if you want to treat patients with lymphoma, you want to give them the chemotherapy on time and a full dense chemotherapy. So we've noticed that patients on protease inhibitors, they couldn't really tolerate the, the chemotherapy full dose and they had, we had to do dose reductions and we had to do uh, extended intervals. So, and we, we certainly from our, from our experience and others also, we, we, we say that protease inhibitor based regimen should be used with extreme caution with vinca alkaloids. And I personally like to avoid um, them completely if, if possible or we've got to reduce the dose of vinca alkaloids. Um, and definitely is idovidine, and, and this is mainly because of the increased risk, risk of neurotoxicity, um, constipation, bowel obstruction, peripheral neuropathy. We've seen a lot of those in patients on protease inhibitors and vinca alkaloids. And certainly AZT uh, use should be avoided in patients treated with chemotherapy due to the significant increased risk of hematological toxicities. So take home messages for the first part of the presentation is the, the advent of antiretroviral therapy has completely changed the picture of the treatment of HIV associated lymphomas. There's definitely been major improvement in the outcomes of HIV associated lymphomas and outcomes are now parallel to the, the, those observed in HIV negative patients.
And current evidence does support the concurrent use of antiretroviral therapy and chemotherapy for HIV-associated lymphoma. And we think if it's, a, if it's appropriate from an HIV point of view, PI, non-PI-based regimens should be considered uh, as opposed to PI-based regimens for the treatment of HIV-associated lymphomas in order to minimize treatment-related toxicities, and we should definitely avoid AZT with chemotherapy. So I think that brings us to the first um, audience response questions. So I'll just read the question out to you. Which of the following is true regarding the treatment of HIV-associated lymphoma? Introduction of uh, antiretrovirals has had minimal effect on the outcomes of HIV-associated lymphoma. Zidovudine or AZT should be used concurrently with chemotherapy for HIV-associated lymphoma. Current evidence supports ceasing antiretrovirals during chemotherapy for HIV-associated lymphoma. Treatment outcomes of HIV-associated lymphoma are now similar to those observed with HIV-negative patients. So I'll just give you um, a couple of seconds to answer. All right. Yep, thank you. That's right. Okay. So now we're moving on to the uh, next uh, part of the presentation, which is um, transplant and HIV. Now, in the, in the, negative, in the HIV negative setting, both autologous and allogeneic stem cell transplant have been, become very well established therapeutic options for our patients. And, and that's primarily we use it for patients who are in remission, but they have high risk disease, so we know that they will relapse, so we offer them transplant, or patients with relapsed or refractory disease. And because now HIV patients are better able to tolerate chemotherapy um, and the results are now similar to non-HIV patients, consequently in the, in the, context, in the antiretroviral therapy era, autologous stem cell transplant and transplant in general has been used in order to, or has been investigated in order to um, bring remission in our patients. So first I'll be talking about autologous stem cell transplant and HIV. Now the first case report was in the 1996 done by a French group. Uh, which was a 40-year-old uh, male with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma given beam conditioning. Uh, this was before the antiretroviral therapy era, so the patient had multiple opportunistic infections, uh, as you would expect, CMV, MAC, and cryptosporidium. And the patient died. But they confirmed that this is actually doable and feasible because the patient is engrafted, and they managed to do a success successful stem collection. Now, in the post-antiretroviral therapy era, there's been six uh, non-randomized studies and two cohort studies comparing HIV positive to HIV negative patients. I've listed some of the studies that um, used autologous stem cell transplant for the use of, for the treatment of HIV associated lymphomas. Now that included uh, both non-Hodgkin's and Hodgkin's lymphoma. And as you can see here, the number ranges from 20 up to 68 and they're done by the BM, e, uh, EBMT group. Um, and you know, if you look at the transplant-related mortality, now that, that's not, not bad at all. I mean, this is sort of even close to what we normally see in the, in the non-HIV patients, you know, 1 to 5 percent. And certainly I know that uh, the, the percentage uh, as centers are getting better at doing autologous stem cell transplant and sort of moving closer to the 1 percent mark, that's still pretty good. Sorry. That's still pretty good. Uh, and as you can see here, these studies had sort of, some of them had reasonable follow-up times, and the overall survival is, you know, is, is quite good too. So that's actually quite feasible, and, and results are encouraging. Now, if you look also at the same studies, um, a lot of these studies, in fact, most of them intended to continue antiretroviral therapy with the conditioning. Now, the conditioning ranged from CBV, beam, uh, even uh, the use of busulfan um, um, sometimes. But, but most of the studies intended to continue antiretroviral therapy with the chemotherapy. Now, they, some patients could not tolerate both the chemotherapy and the antiretrovirals at the same time because of significant nausea and vomiting and mucositis. So we'll talk a bit about that afterwards. But there's definitely been an intention to continue antiretrovirals during the chemotherapy. And as you can see here, the, the, the CD4 count sort of range. This is, by the way, the CD4 count at the diagnosis of the lymphoma. So as you can see here, it, it, the CD4 count ranged from very low to, you know, patients with very high CD4 count. And as you'd expect, a lot of patients had neutropenic infections. And, that ex and that's expected even in the, in the HIV negative population. 
But what's important to note is that a lot of patients had late complications and particularly viral complications uh, like CMV. Not, not normally we, see, we don't normally see CMV as sort of a, a major problem in autologous stem cell transplant, but it is uh, a problem in HIV patients undergoing autologous stem cell transplant. So um, uh, most of these in viral infections were not fatal, but it's certainly something that we need to be very careful when we're transplanting our patients um, in terms of post-transplant surveillance and monitoring and the management of making sure that your patient's on appropriate prophylaxis. It's even more crucial for HIV patients. And during these studies, there was not a significant problem with uh, engraftment. So patients engrafted normally, except for one patient who, were on, uh, who was on AZ AZT and uh, had prolonged neutropenia, and when they stopped the AZT, the, the patient engrafted nicely. So it, it is feasible. And um, this is our experience with the uh, autologous stem cell transplant at St. Vincent's Hospital. We've done actually uh, a few. We've done 12 autologous stem cell transplant for various indications, and, um, and we had no treatment-related mortality. Uh, and all patients continued the antiretrovirals during the conditioning chemotherapy. Uh, six patients relapsed, two salvaged by allogeneic stem cell transplant and two um, multiple myeloma uh, were salvaged, salvaged by salvage treatment. We had one case of bacterial endocarditis and one case of PML, and uh, surprisingly, they both resolved, especially with the PML, which is quite nasty um, uh, opportunistic infection to get. Um, uh, and uh, the non-treatment related deaths is listed here. We've actually had one unfortunate uh, case of AZT. The patient was not on AZT during transplant, but uh, about six to eight months it was changed to AZT and the patient developed uh, um, AZT-related lactic acidosis, which is a nasty side effect of AZT. One developed second malignancy and, uh, sorry, and um, um, with, with Hodgkin's lymphoma and three patients relapsed. And the overall survival tend to be from one to eight years, which I think is, is also a pretty good result. Now, if you're looking at some of the cohort studies that compared HIV to non-HIV patients, and this is the study by Amita Krishnan from the City of Hope, uh, comparing overall survival, now that's pretty non-significant. I don't think you can get any non more non-significant than that. But the outcomes are quite similar in terms of overall survival comparing HIV positive and non-HIV patients. Now, just looking at um, the, um, the study, this study by Armada Krishnan, and comparing the two arms, you, you notice that uh, there's not a difference in, uh, in engraftment. In, in fact, it's probably a bit better in the HIV arm. And, but there is a double number of infections, double number of infections, 28 versus 14. Now, whilst none of the, these patients died from um, these nasty infections, but it just sort of highlights that, um, that these patients are probably at more risk of infections compared to the normal HIV patients. I think it's fair to say that. And this is certainly the experience we've sort of encountered. So um, this is obviously highlights the, the extreme importance of close monitoring of those patients post-transplant, especially if these patients from rural areas or areas sort of far from the center. It's very important to have a system in place to monitor those patients quite closely. And what about immune reconstitution? And the same study by Armada Krishnan, um, she, they looked at um, the immune reconstitution, sorry if you can't see this clearly, but they looked at the immune reconstitution post the, uh, the transplant, and they've noticed that most patients were sort of started to sort of have good immune reconstitution around six months, and increased sort of around one year, and certainly by two years, um, it was sort of in the normal range. And this has certainly been our experience. Our experience at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney has sort of been more towards the one year mark. So that, again, highlights the importance of careful monitoring of those patients um, just to make sure that they've got good immune, immune reconstitution. Now, some of these studies listed some sort of prognostic factors for um, HIV patients going through transplant. And I've listed here some of the poor prognostic features from a couple of the studies. And some of them, um, patients not achieving CR, so not achieving CR um, going to transplant was a poor diagnostic uh, feature. Uh, chemo-resistant disease uh, prior to transplant, more than two prior treatments, marrow involvement and stage four disease, poor performance status, CD4 count less than, less than 100, and that's at diagnosis. Uh, 
and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma other than diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, recent opportunistic infections, and high HIV DNA levels at the transplant. Surprisingly, hepatitis co-infection did not adversely affect the outcomes for those patients. What about stem cell mobilization? Um, well, we know that HIV virus is known to alter the microenvironment, and, and certainly um, with the use of antiretrovirals, it can overcome that. Um, so, because antiretrovirals will help HIV patients regain some of the normal hematopoiesis, and it's likely to improve the cell recovery, uh, cell fun stem cell function and recovery if HIV viral load remains suppressed. So, we certainly recommend to consider continuation of antiretrovirals during high dose chemotherapy. Avoid AZT, that's for sure, because that can definitely affect uh, your ability to collect the stem cells and it definitely can prolong engrafting in the engraftment in the setting of an autologous stem cell transplant. And uh, also people looked at whether filgrastim exacerbate or the HIV replication or not, and it didn't actually find found to be significant in terms of affecting HIV replication. So take home messages from the autologous stem cell transplant review in HIV patients. It is a feasible strategy, an effective option for HIV patients with hematological malignancy, especially those with relapsed disease. And survival outcomes appear to be parallel to HIV negative patients. Opportunistic infections are common, and it's something that we have to be very careful, especially the, uh, the, um, the viral infections. Um, and that really mandates very careful post-transplant surveillance and an important sort of role for pharmacists to make sure that the patients stay on their uh, prophylactic medicines and the counseling with regards to that. Uh, CD4 can't recover around the six to 12 months mark and uh, will definitely consider continuing antiretrovirals during the chemotherapy with high dose chemotherapy for mobilization and during conditioning if, uh, if, if your patients can tolerate it. And definitely avoid AZT during high dose chemotherapy and mobilization. That's for sure because of the, again, for the significant neutropenia. Okay, so moving on to the second question <clears throat> Which of the following is not considered a poor diagnostic feature for patients? So, not considered a poor diagnostic feature for patients undergoing stem cell transplant, autologous stem cell transplant for HIV associated lymphoma. Poor performance status, undetectable HIV viral load at, at uh, transplant, CD4 count less than 100, chemotherapy resistant diseases prior to transplant. Just need a couple of seconds to answer. So that's not considered. Yes, thank you. That's right. It's always good to. Get the answer right. Okay. Okay, now moving on to the next part of the presentation, which is the use of allogeneic stem cell transplant. <clears throat> now, the, the, the use of allogeneic stem cell transplant for HIV associated hematological malignancy obviously poses sort of more challenges. Um, you've got the risk of chronic immune suppression, you've got the risk of opportunistic infections because of the immune suppression you're using the complex drug interactions, not just the chemotherapy, but also the immune suppression and calcineurin inhibitors and so forth. But the, there has been encouraging reports with the solid organ transplants that sort of allayed some of the concerns regarding uh, chronic immune suppression. And these patients, in fact, can have good immune reconstitution. Um, HIV viral load could still be well controlled with uh, antiretrovirals, and that's extremely important to try to control um, your, your HIV, the, the, the viral load for HIV patients during the treatment because as we saw from the, the lymphoma studies, it's certainly been uh, linked with better outcomes and less opportunistic infections. And um, the drug interactions due to the CYP450 inhibition by certain antiretrovirals were managed by dose adjustment of calcineurin inhibitors. Um, so we've looked, sort, of, sort of looked at some of the literature case reports that describing allogeneic stem cell transplant. There's certainly been increasing reports uh, since um, the introduction of antiretrovirals to increase um, reports of successful allogeneic stem cell transplants in HIV patients. And especially there's been an increased uptake since the introduction of the reduced intensity conditioning. There is little data on the immune reconstitution post-transplant, but it appears not too different from the HIV negative population. And almost all cases continue or intend to continue antiretrovirals and, um, during chemotherapy and engraftment or during transplant, 
and engraftment does not appear impaired. And opportunistic infections do not also appear increased. And I'm not going to talk about the, you know, the cure of HIV using stem cell transplant, but I've just put that out there. It may have a secondary benefit in reducing the pool of latent HIV infected lymphocytes. <clears throat> now, looking at some of the uh, literature reports for the use of um, um, allogeneic stem cell, stem cell transplant, uh, this is the CIBMTR retrospective review. And as you can see here, they've, uh, they've listed some of the uh, cases they've done at the pre in the early days before the, the introduction of antiretrovirals. Um, and definitely, if you see here, the, the outcome is you know, quite poor. But after the introduction of the antiretrovirals, uh, this is sort of nine patients and three uh, patients had reduced intensity conditioning. Eight patients continued antiretrovirals, eight out of nine. And you can certainly see that the results are, are much better uh, compared to the previous um, cohort. And that's all thanks to antiretroviral therapy. And obviously the ability to introduce RIC um, or reduce intensity conditioning. So this is some of the, I'm not going to go into detail about the, the case reports, but this is sort of the, some of the case reports reporting successful stem cell transplant with myeloablative stem cell transplant and use of antiretrovirals. And this is the all famous sort of harder case uh, where the patient is, um, is off antiretrovirals and uh, still alive. That's probably maybe more than five years now. But it's certainly confirmed that this, is, this is, can be done. And reports of the um, non-myeloblative or reduced intensity conditioning with antiretrovirals, I've got you some of those um, case reports, and certainly it, um, the results have been quite good. I mean, I've listed here the, the three cases that we've done at St. Vincent's Hospital. This is probably one of the sort of the first cases um, um, to, to be sort of uh, published uh, in the, for, I mean, I think it's the only case for the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, for the treatment of uh, primary fusion lymphoma. Um, and the patient is still alive. We've done also two more, and all patients, all three patients that we've done at St. Vincent's Hospital are still alive as we speak. So, um, it, it, again, it is a feasible option to do an allergenic stem cell transplant using reduced intensity conditioning and continue to antiretroviral therapy during the conditioning and have sort of successful outcomes. <clears throat> what about, we've touched more on immune reconstitution. Now, as we said before, in the autologous setting, there's been reports of immune reconstitution sort of around six to 12 months mark. And we think that, I mean, the, the literature on the allogeneic is much more um, limited. But data in the non-HIV patients suggest that the rate of immune reconstitution after transplant is dependent more on factors like type of conditioning regimens and development of grub versus host. And that sort of... Um, highlights that maybe with, with a strategy for HIV patients that you may want to consider reduced intensity conditioning as opposed to myeloblative. This has certainly been the sort of directions, direction we've, we took at St. Vincent's Hospital is that we, we're using the RIC induced conditioning um, because of the fact that, um, you know, market toxicity that we may encounter with a myeloblative setting. Now, people might argue this, but you know, certainly the introduction of the uh, RIC regimens has sort of made a big difference uh, in keeping the efficacy of grab versus leukemia effect, but also maintaining the um, lowering the toxicity. Okay, so just moving on to the third question. Which of the following is true regarding the use of allogeneic stem cell transplant for HIV infected patients with hematological malignancies? Allogeneic stem cell transplant is a feasible option for HIV-infected patients with high-risk hematological malignancies. Grub versus host seems to be minimal with HIV patients due to impaired immunity. Continuation of antiretrovirals during stem cell transplant is generally not recommended, and the risk of opportunistic infections is generally very low. So it might be a bit of a confusing question, this one. That's the correct answer. Thank you. A is the correct answer. Okay, now moving on to the sort of the most exciting a bit of the presentation is just the pharmaceutical consideration for HIV patients undergoing stem cell transplant. Um, 
And if I have time, there is a case study towards the end. We'll go through it. Okay, so what about antiretrovirals during uh, stem cell, uh, during the conditioning or during the process of transplant? Now, there's no evidence to say that giving antiretrovirals during conditioning adversely affected transplant outcomes. I know that there's a couple of um, trials um, recommend cessation of antiretrovirals before the conditioning regimens and recontinue that after seven days from the, tra from the finishing of the conditioning regimens. But there's actually no evidence for that. I mean, I know that drug interactions sometimes can be hard to sort of navigate through, especially with antiretrovirals, but there's, there's no evidence that adversely affects the outcome. So try to continue antiretrovirals as much as possible, but watch for drug interactions. Um, AZT, as we said before, should be avoided in patients undergoing stem cell transplant due to significant increase in hematological toxicities and potential delay of engraftment. Protease inhibitors are non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, the both substrates and potent inhibitors or inducers of the CYP450 system. So, especially with drugs like ritonavir, which is probably the strongest CYP3A4 inhibitor on the planet and probably the universe. <laughs> But um, if you want to see a striking interaction, put patient on tacrolimus on ritonavir. And this is when you start seeing uh, tacrolimus once a week or once every two weeks. It's like a tacrolimus sparing uh, agent. Um, cyclosporin, the risk of interaction is also dramatic. And serolimus. Now, I probably put that interaction as sort of highly significant, probably towards more like contraindication. I mean, I get very nervous when I hear about serolimus and ritonavir. But our experience with cyclosporin is that we've, if, a, if we had a patient on protease inhibitors, they're coming for transplant, we slash the cyclosporin dose by 50%. And we even give it once a day. Because we've noticed that even if we slash the dose by 50% and give it twice a day, we still have very high trough levels. So from our experience, we now give a 50% dose reduction and give it only once a day, and we still actually have to adjust downwards. It's extremely um, striking interaction. So that's something that um, we've really got to be careful of. And if you look at the actual, this is a slide just sort of gathered for you regarding the different metabolism routes for different antiretrovirals. Sort of this is tenofovir uh, and 3TC and abacavir are sort of the, the, the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor class. They don't actually have any potential interaction as in PK interaction, because they're mainly sort of um, um, renal -like secreted and abacavir is hepatically secreted, but there's, there's minimal effect on the CYP3A4. But as you move on to the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, particularly efavirenz, <coughs> it's a very potent inducer of the CYP3A4. So if you, you would expect if you put patients on cyclosporin and tacrolimus or itraconazole or voriconazole that the efavirenz will just eat it away. Um, Adazanavir, darunavir, ritonavir, these are the protease inhibitors, and they definitely are very strong inhibitors of the CYP3A4, particularly the ritonavir. And ritonavir is not just a CYP3A4, it's a, it's a major sort of inhibitor of um, a lot of enzymes, and it's also inducer of other enzymes too, which makes it very confusing. Especially when you put patients on ritonavir and, vor and voriconazole, it's a paradoxical interaction initially. You would get this major inhibition of the enzyme, and then afterwards you get uh, induction. But the, my favorite drug in terms of drug interaction is raltegravir. It's an integrase inhibitor. It's a, a sort of uh, one of the newish sort of agents for HIV. But it's, uh, it's now listed as uh, for the treatment, uh, first line treatment. But it actually has very minimal um, <clears throat> CYP3A40 sort of uh, CYP3A4 um, enzyme activity. So it's not really, an, uh, doesn't induce or, or, uh, or inhibit any of the enzymes. So certainly, Raltigravir, I will definitely consider for patients going through transplant, especially allogeneic stem cell transplant. And if it's okay from an HIV point of view, I would actively work with the team to switch patients on protease inhibitors or non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors coming through transplant to um, raltigravir. But that's only if it's okay from an HIV point of view, because sometimes it's not possible, because you know, in, in, um, raltigravir has a sort of a, a low barrier for genetic resistance, so you can develop resistance to it quite easily. So if you've got a patient with significant background resistance uh, for HIV mutations, 
uh, and HIV mutations, then you, you certainly want to do that very cautiously. Also, another drug is the Maravaroc, which is the CCR5 antagonist, which is also, although it's a substrate of the CYP3 or 4, but it's not an inhibitor or inducer of the metabolism. So it's also a, another option, certainly in the, uh, in the context of, you know, even with the uh, emerging reports of its anti grub versus host activity. And <clears throat> the next point to discuss, what about mucositis, nausea, and vomiting? I mean, some PIs, this is quite challenging because some protease inhibitors need to be taken with food. And if the patient is vomiting or quite nauseous or got mucositis, it's very hard for them to tolerate it. And stopping antiretroviral therapy also can be leading to problems because if you've got a patient on efavirenz, for example, which has got a very long half-life of about 40 hours, and you've got two other drugs who um, has sort of got um, um, short half-life because in HIV you need to use at least three drugs from two classes. If Averins has got a very long half-life, so if you stop all the antiretrovirals all, all at once, you effectively end up with if Averins monotherapy for up to a week. And that can lead to resistance. So it's very important when you even try to stop the antiretrovirals before, to trans before transplant, you do that uh, very carefully and you probably do that with involvement of your um, HIV team or ID team or the HIV pharmacist. It's extremely important to have that multidisciplinary cooperation. And it's not just the PK uh, interactions, as we said before, you know, added renal toxicity. So if you've got a patient on cyclosporin and tenofovir, tenofovir has is is got a lot of renal toxicity. So if you have both uh, the patient on both drugs, you need to monitor the patient closely for renal toxicity. And also supportive therapy and antiretrovirals drug interactions you know, acid suppressants and adazanavir. We know that adazanavir, which is a protease inhibitor, is affected by changes in pH. Antifungals and corticosteroids do interact also with, um, with antiretroviral. So it's, it's really a, a lot of um, drug interactions to manage. So, so as a piece of advice, if you can, going to transplant, put your patients on drugs with minimal drug interactions like raltigravir or maravaroc. If it's okay from an HIV point of view, it's probably a good idea to do that. And the other important consideration is prophylaxis. Now, this is extremely important to try to make sure that your patients are on appropriate prophylaxis after treatment. So whether antifungal, uh, PJP, and toxoplasma prophylaxis. And I just wanted to note that we actually had a breakthrough of toxoplasma infection on a patient who was on Bactrim three times a week. And we looked back and um, sort of looked at the literature, and we found a paper, which is sort of a, um, um, a case control sort of cohort, looking at um, some HIV patients who developed toxoplasma and some who didn't, and they certainly recommend, uh, came up with the conclusion that you certainly need at least four tablets of double strength spectrum a week to, to protect your patients against toxo. And since that incident that ha happened, and, and we've actually put our patients, all of our transplant patients and HIV patients on at least four tablets a week. Um, antiviral prophylaxis is also quite important. Um, MAC prophylaxis is often forgotten. It is, it's very important, especially if CD4 count is less than 75 for HIV patients. CMV monitoring is not particularly um, something you would think about, especially in the autologous stem cell transplant, but certainly something that we always do in the allogeneic. So even patients with autologous stem cell transplant, especially those HIV patients, when they have a CD4 count of less than 100, they're at risk of CMV reactivation. So it's probably a good idea to make sure you have very close monitoring of CMV. And obviously the viral load monitoring, the CD4 count monitoring after transplant. And there may be a role for therapeutic drug monitoring of antiretrovirals because we do always think about the monitoring of other drugs, but we can actually do an, um, uh, therapeutic drug monitoring for antiretrovirals. Um, and I know that a lot of centers in the US and, and Canada also do that. Uh, but it certainly is a good guide for you to just to make sure that your antiretrovirals are actually not affected by changes with the other drugs. So this is, I think, my last question. Um, which of the following antiretroviral agents would be less likely to contribute to drug interactions with common immune suppressant agents used in HIV patients undergoing allogeneic stem cell transplants? Okay. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Okay, now I'm not sure if I have time to go through the case study, but I'll just go through it quickly just to highlight a very sort of quick couple of points. 
So we had a patient, who, a 56-year-old patient, and um, he had um, AML secondary to lymphoma treatment, and the patient um, had good performance status, very good control on HIV, and the patient uh, was on a treatment regimen that included um, tenofovir and tricytabine and um, lopinavir ritonavir, which is Kaletra, twice a day. And the patient had very good CD4 count um, and good um, HIV um, control and no AIDS diagnosis. Initially, he elected not to have a MUD, but unfortunately he relapsed afterwards and then we reinduced him and then the patient was then brought for um, a transplant with uh, a fludarabine, milfalan, rick, rick bone marrow transplant. The patient got discharged post day plus 21 with no major complications. I just wanted to highlight, he actually only needed 20 milligrams once daily of cyclosporin. And we normally see our patients leaving uh, sort of the, uh, the ward with, with sort of much more than that. So usually 150 twice a day or even more. Uh, but this patient only needed 20 milligrams once daily of cyclosporin. That's because of the interaction of cyclosporin and ritonavir kaletra, uh, ritonavir lupinavir in the kaletra. And he only needed itraconazole 100 milligrams once a day. And uh, you can argue that ritonavir, as I said, is an itraconazole sparing agent because he had very good levels only on one tablet of itraconazole, 100 milligrams. And post-transplant, he was given the appropriate prophylaxis. He did develop a bit of gravis host, which is settled with prednisone, and the viral load was consistently not detected. However, the patient sort of got admitted afterwards uh, in January 2012 with sort of neurological symptoms and the CD um, scan of the head sort of revealed space occupying lesions. And the, there was negative CMV PCR, uh, negative toxoplasma serology. The patient was adherent to the, the, the Bactrim, but he was only taking three times a week, one tablet, double strength three times a week. And, but he continued, uh, condition rapidly deteriorated. So the team has decided, so this is uh, to do an MRI, and this is sort of the, um, they've showed multiple rim enhancing lesions um, in, in both hemispheres. And the team decided to just to get to the bottom of this. They did a, um, a biopsy of a left front of lesion, and uh, they confirmed the diagnosis of cerebral toxicity. This was actually quite interesting because the patient was on Bactrim th three times a week. The patient had a negative tox toxoserology, but when they did a PCR on the actual uh, biopsy, it was positive for toxo. And the patient was put on uh, um, triple therapy for toxoplasma, and the patient has improved. And, and also to note that he'd also developed herpes zoster despite prophylactic Valtrex and had a chest infection. So he had a, quite a lot of infections. But despite that, he had excellent recovery and discharged uh, to rehab after two months. And the patient, I saw him actually only a few weeks before I came to, to before I, f I flew over here, and he was actually doing pretty good and he's walking normally. So I just put this case study to highlight two things. Firstly, is the drug interactions that you, we certainly has to, have to reduce the, the doses of cyclosporin and itraconazole dramatically for patients on, on, uh, on uh, Kaletra. And unfortunately with this patient, we, we, we didn't have time to uh, switch his antiretrovirals before transplant, and he also had significant background resistance, so we couldn't switch him to raltegravir. Uh, but also I wanted to highlight the fact that this may be, we have to be very careful about our toxo and prophylaxis because we had a breakthrough um, case here, even though the patient has been complying with his Bactrim thrice weekly, which is why after this case we sort of increased our prophylaxis to four tablets a week. So in conclusion, um, autologous stem cell transplant is an acceptable and safe strategy to salvage patients with relapsed resistant non-Hodgkin's or Hodgkin's lymphoma. Results are similar to the non-HIV infected population. There's limited data for allogeneic stem cell transplant in the post antiretroviral therapy era, but certainly reasonable early results justify its continued use, and perhaps more of the non-myeloblative protocols we should use to minimize toxicity. Immune reconstitution is similar to non-HIV patients for autologous stem cell transplant and appears satisfactory for allogeneic stem cell transplant. However, opportunistic infections may be more common, mandating careful post-transplant surveillance. Antiretrovirals may be continued to help optimize immune recovery, but watch for drug interactions. So I think the best approach in managing those patients is to have a multidisciplinary 
cooperation between oncologists, hematologists, HIV physicians and clinical pharmacists with both experience in oncology and HIV is important and needed to ensure that HIV patients with malignancies or presenting to a transplant are suitably managed. And just, just a photo of beautiful Sydney and the World AIDS Day. This is a Sydney Opera House. And uh, that's the beautiful uh, Harbour Bridge. Um, thank you. I'll take questions. If... Could you please comment on the interaction between the newer FDA-approved drug, Stribild, um, Elvitegravir, and the strong inhibitor, Cobicistat, and uh, potential drug interactions with chemotherapy? Yes, thank you. I mean, uh, w w we don't know much about it as yet in the, in the clinical setting. We had one patient um, uh, presenting um, for treatment. Now, if you look at the Cobicistat, they, they say it's a very strong CYP3 and 4 inhibitor. But I've sort of got a feeling after sort of looking at it, it's not as strong as ritonavir. But certainly in the context of the, the treatment, especially with uh, HIV-associated lymphomas, I would certainly be more sort of worried about the interaction. So I would definitely consider if there is um, an opportunity to switch the patient of the copsistat to do that. Otherwise, I'll just recommend a dose reduction of chemotherapy. Now, when I say dose reduction of chemotherapy, that's obviously mainly for HIV-associated lymphomas, and we don't actually have any guidance on how to reduce the dose by. So that's why I'm always for switching the patients off that interacting agent, if we can, from an, if, it's, if it's doable from an HIV point of view, rather than dose reduction of chemotherapy, especially in the curative setting. You don't want to be reducing your doses of chemotherapy. Now, ropivirine, is that, did you ask about ropivirine also? Oh, okay. Ropivirine is, is another uh, non-nuke, and it's not as a strong in, inducer of the CYP2B6 as the efavirenz. So we had a patient actually on um, ropivirine who we continued, and he was on Codex M for Burkitt's lymphoma, the patient went into complete remission. And we'll hopefully we'll publish that case soon. But uh, uh, it's not a very strong in, uh, induction sort of potential, so I would continue it. Hello, Kelly Cross from my Cleveland Clinic. Thank you so much. This is a really interesting topic. Thank you. We've uh, transplanted one HIV patient who was an auto, and we were able to switch to Raltegravir, as you suggested. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious about your case study yeah. um, where you said that you couldn't switch them off, and I think you said you used fludarabine and busulfan if you... No, uh, fludarabine and milfalan. Oh, and melphalan. Okay. Never mind then. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, the, the interaction with busulfan, if you want to ask about, do you want to ask about busulfan and ritonavir? Uh, yes. Yes, that's what I was thinking. So, Thank you. There is, again, there is no evidence um, or case reports or literature to suggest what is the interaction between busulfan and ritonavir, but I can tell you that uh, it's probably... I don't think it's that significant because busulfan, although it has some sort of sip... Uh, metabolism, I don't think it, it, it is that significant. Would I switch a patient uh, on ritonavir if he's receiving busulfan? Would I switch the patient on ritonavir? I probably would do it anyway if I can, but if I can't, at least we have the TDM monitoring for busulfan and we can monitor toxicity. So that's something that uh, we do at our institution too, we monitor the busulfan and we adjust the, the PK. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about um, the auto patients. Yeah. If you'd had any patients who'd failed to mobilise, and if you did, if you'd consider using plurixophore in those yeah. patients, as it did start its life as a HIV investigational drug. Yes, oh, that's an interesting question. I uh, uh, and thank you for that. Look, I, I haven't had a case of plurixophore as yet with HIV patients, but. Um, I don't see any problems in actually giving it. I don't think there is a, a major um, drug interactions, but uh, it's always easy to say that when you don't actually have an, a sort of a solid evidence and you haven't done it. But um, um, yeah, I, I would. If I have, a, if I had an HIV patient who failed to mobilise, I'll definitely recommend plurixophore. I mean, this is pretty good because you know some of the HIV patients who, uh, if you look at the literature. Um, um, they looked at all the HIV patients who um, went, underwent stem cell mobilization, 
and about 23% of them actually failed to mobilize. So that's a significant number. So I can certainly, if I've got Plerixifor, I'll use it for that patient. Thanks for a great presentation. I'm Thank David Samuel here from Medical City, Dallas. Uh, what is your experience with nocardia, CNS nocardia in this patient population, if you had any? And what recommendation would you have for a duration of treatment in this uh, category of patients? And would it be different in patients that don't have HIV? Thank you. That's a pretty hard question to answer. Well, actually, I haven't had any uh, problems with nocardia, even in the bone marrow transplant setting. Um, in our hospital, we had a couple of patients with solid organ transplants with nocardia infection. Uh, uh, I, I, I can't really comment on the duration because I don't have much experience with it, but I know that our ID physicians do recommend the continuation of nocardia treatment for up to six months post-transplant. I think it all depends on your immune reconstitution. In a setting of HIV patient, if your patient has still very low CD4 count, i.e. less than 200, I'll definitely continue treatment or I'll continue prophylaxis. I'll be very nervous about stopping treatment for serious infection if the patient had a CD4 count of less than 200. All right. Thank you. Thank you.